Hey guys, welcome back to the Refuge Church Q&A series. I'm Pastor Kellen, and uh, just as always with the Q&A series, what we're doing is answering questions that come in by text from people that attend our services, hear the messages that we're, we're given at Refuge, and, they, and uh, you know, sometimes we're just not clear enough, or, or uh, it's things that we say um, lead people's minds to asking other questions about what we're talking about, and so the just to reaffirm the vision of this, uh, what we're trying to do is just answer those questions that people have as they come up. And, and I do want to say just um, that anybody who watches this, we're putting this out on YouTube, Facebook. If you have questions that you want us to answer, then uh, feel free to message us on Facebook or send us a, an email, which you can do at our website, which is refugeutah.org. And so uh, to get into this one today, we have a kind of a, kind of a hard question. But it's a good question, and it's one that has a lot of implications for how we relate to Jesus as his followers. And so I'll just read you the text that came in on this one. It says, I have been struggling wrapping my brain around the idea of Jesus being tempted. I always thought of temptation as already being sin. If I am tempted to curse at my boss, even if I don't act on it, I have sinned. How was he who was perfect tempted? How can we use that to say that he can relate to our temptations? And so this question really is kind of like a, a, a multi-layered question. And the things that are being asked in it specifically, really what's at the heart of this is, is temptation itself sin? Is it possible to be tempted and not sin? And then secondly, if Jesus is perfect, as, as Christians would affirm that he is and was, how is it that he was tempted? You know, and so I think there's a lot of places you could go in the scripture to look at this uh, issue. And I've, I've chosen a few verses out of James chapter 1, specifically verses 12 through 15. And I'm going to read those for you now. It says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And so, in answer to the first part of this question, you guys, based on the scripture, I would say that uh, temptation itself is not a sin. And this is a hard thing to get our minds around, but it's a, it's a crucial thing to get our minds around. And just for, just for a couple notes on this from this passage alone, he says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Like, if temptation was a sin in itself, he couldn't say, Blessed are you when you endure it. Because he would say you were enduring sin. You were going through sin. And, but he says when you endure temptation, you're blessed, indicating that there was a trial, but you didn't fail. Okay? And then... He goes on and he says in verse 14 of James chapter 1, just again, each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and he's enticed. And so that's where the moment of temptation begins. We all feel that in different ways. You know, for many, many of us, it's, you could just bring up the lust factor. That moment that you see somebody that's attractive, that you're not married to, and there's that temptation to, wow, I'm going to check them out. And then and you're like, well, no, no, no. You know, you start having this fight. But there's these inward desires trying to tempt you to start fantasizing about that person. That is, in essence, what temptation is. But notice that it says sin comes after those desires happen. The desires themselves aren't sin. Because in verse 15 he says, Then when desire, those tempting desires, um, has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So sin comes after those tempting desires, indicating temptation in and of itself is not sin. And so... This is, this is, to me, one of the, the most liberating things to realize in, in our fight with sin as Christians, that just being tempted isn't the sin. And the reason that that's liberating for me is because it, it, it helps me see the real battle that I should be fighting, what the real goal I should have in my struggle against sin. It's not to never be tempted in this life. 
if you're fighting to a place, you think your goal is that, oh, I just have to get to a place where I'm never tempted to fantasize about somebody I'm not married to again or some other sin, you know. I want to tell you that you're going to be a very disappointed and very frustrated person. Because as long as you live, even though you, you've believed that Jesus died for your sins and, and you've been born again by the Spirit, if you've done all those things, you're a Christian, that stuff's going on in your life, you have the Spirit in you. And you have a new nature in you that's, that's leading you into righteousness, but you also have your sin that's still dwelling in your body until the return of Christ or until your death or the rapture, okay? And so the, the very reality of that means that for, uh, until the end of your life or the, the, the time that Jesus comes back for you, there's going to be a battle. There's going to be temptation. And so if your goal is to not be tempted, you're never going to meet that goal until the next life. And But when you realize that temptation itself isn't sin, it changes your goal so that you're not fighting to never be tempted, but what your fight is is to not respond to the temptations in a sinful way, to not go through with the temptations, to not let those desires give birth to sin in your life. And so just practically speaking, if I'm walking down the road and I see some lady that's really beautiful and that, that desire temptation comes up in my heart, you know, oh man, yeah, she looks good. And I go, oh, but you know, I'm not going to do that because I'm married and, and I'm not going not gonna to let those thoughts go any further than this. I was tempted, but I didn't sin. Now, reverse that, you know, or rewind that. If I, that same situation comes up and I see a lady and she is attractive and I'm not married to her and I start undressing her with my eyes, with my mind and, and, and imagining, you know, what it would be like to be intimate with her, then those desires have given birth to sin and I've carried them out. And so that's the first part of this. Being tempted in itself is not sin. So how could Jesus be tempted if he's perfect? Uh, one of the things that the Bible doesn't fully explain to us, but it definitely affirms, is that beings with a perfect nature can be tempted to sin and yet overcome it or not, you know. And so you see this with Adam and Eve. They were created perfect, and yet the serpent, Satan, came and tempted them to disobey God. They didn't respond to those temptations in a good way, but they gave in to them. And then they became sinfully, sinful beings inherently. So Jesus, he is perfect. He is 100% God, and yet he can be tempted. But there's, a, there's an issue here, because James just said, uh, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God in verse 13, because God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone himself. So if Jesus is God and this says God can't be tempted, what's up? Well, what you have to realize about Jesus Christ is that while the Bible definitely affirms that he is absolutely 100% God, it also affirms 100% that he is also man. 100% man. And you can read about this in the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, for example. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it tells us in verse 14, this is all speaking of Jesus, that the Word, who is God, became flesh, and he dwelt among us. And so, when the Bible talks about Jesus being tempted, it's not talking about him being tempted in his divinity. It is talking about him being tempted in his humanity. But Jesus, unlike us, unlike our first human parents, Adam and Eve, when he was tempted to sin in his humanity, he endured every temptation. And that's why he is crowned with a name that is above every name, uh, as it speaks of in Philippians 2, because he was tempted in all points as we are, as Hebrews 4.14 says, and yet without sin. And so the great thing that this brings, this truth brings to us as Christians, that Jesus was tempted like us because he was a man like us, uh, even though he was God, and that he, he endured those temptations without sin, is that our Savior isn't some just some distant God that's only transcendent that can't relate to us, but he's a God who can relate to us. Think of the most severe, intense, fierce moments of temptation that you endure in your life. You need to know that your Savior, if you're a Christian and you believe in Jesus, has felt that same level of intensity in a moment of temptation, and yet he endured sinlessly. And what that brings to us is not only a Savior that we can relate to, that's been there, that can sympathize with us, but Jesus endured that temptation sinlessly so that by faith in him, God could credit us with his sinless life. 
through faith. And that's the gospel. Jesus lived the perfect life we could never live. He died the death we deserve to die as guilty sinners. And he rose from the dead, conquering death, which we could never do. And if you put your faith in him and trust in him as your Lord and Savior, right now you are forgiven forever for your sins. And when God looks at you, he doesn't see all those moments. He chooses not to, to see all those moments of failure to temptation, but he chooses to see over your life every moment that Jesus endured temptation as the perfect one living a perfect life on your behalf. So I hope that that's comforting for all of us who are Christians. For those of us who are not yet Christians, trust in Jesus because these are the gifts that await you, the relationship with God that awaits you. Keep the questions coming in, guys. Thanks a lot. <laughs>